So the the uh, the axon reflex is responsible for the acute peripheral response to a noxious stimulus, and this was this completely explains the triple response of Lewis Thomas Lewis, who is a very famous um, cardiologist, in fact, who 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 talked about the uh, response, the circulatory response to noxious damage. To understand what happens, we're going to uh, imagine what would happen if a thorn went into your fingertip. Okay, so here's my version of a thorn. It's going into the fingertip. And what I've diagrammed here, if we can zoom in here, um, is a single primary afferent. So this is a primary afferent with its cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, DRG, and it ends in a, a spray of endings. So it gets, an informa it gets information from, a, from this area. This is its receptive field. And let's say that the thorn hits one of these branches. And so now what we think about is that the, uh, there's going to be an action potential here. It's going to go back, it's going to go back, and it's going to go into the central nervous system, and voila, we're going to have pain. That does happen, but there's something else that happens. The action potential can not only, if we look at this diagram, the action potential can not only travel back to the central nervous system, but it can travel down these other endings. There is nothing about, the key point here is that there is nothing about an axon that is polarized. The only thing that polarizes an axon is the existence of a previous action potential. So if you just had an axon, a stretch of axon, you could not tell whether action potentials typically go this way or that way. You just don't know. It can carry, that axon can carry information both ways. So in this situation, the information we know, we happen to know that to get to the CNS, you have to go down this way. But as long as this branch here is silent, if there's no spontaneous activity, then an action potential can invade and go this way too. And it does. Okay? So this action potential that affects this, only this one branch directly is going to end up affecting all of the branches of this cell. And this is what I've diagrammed here. So now this axon, this terminal right here, has, was directly affected, but the action potential then went down every single branch so that every single branch is activated. And there's one more peculiar thing that we have to understand about dorsal ganglion cells. Remember that the, the cell body is in the dorsal root. There's, an ax, there's a process that comes down and splits into a dendrite-like peripheral branch and a axon-like central branch. But as it turns out, the split's not, um, it's, it, they, these two branches are not as distinct as is typically true in a central neuron. So that neurotransmitter is not only sent to the central branch, it's also sent to the peripheral branch. And so the peripheral branch, even though it's dendrite-like, can release neurotransmitter. And it does. It releases neurotransmitter into the periphery from each, and so what you'll see is that each of these endings, every place that there's a synaptic terminal here, there is release of uh, substances from this, uh, from this um, axon. And one of the substances that is released is substance P. Um, and another substance is released is CGRP. We'll look, at the, we'll look at the actual chemicals involved in the next slide. But the point is that the release of substances from all of these different terminals adds up so that even though the injury was right there, and we call that in the spot of the injury, we call it a bleb, B-L-E-B, bleb, um, that, the injure, that the area where you see redness, you see swelling, and where you have pain is, in fact, a much broader area. It's the area where there are axon collaterals from the injured the initially directly injured nociceptors. 
and this is called primary hyperalgesia. So how does primary uh, hyperalgesia work? Here's the nociceptor ending. Something gets it excited, and it releases three factors that we're going to talk about. Substance P, neurokinin A. Substance P is a, is a tachykinin, and neurokinin A is another tachykinin. These are peptides. And CGRP is another uh, peptide. This is calcitonin gene-related peptide. Uh, substance P was named substance P and neurokinin A. So CGRP has the effect of producing vasodilation. In other words, it acts on peripheral blood vessels to dilate them. And what that does is it makes the area red. So as they dilate, you get red, just as though as if you were hot and you have vasodilation. Um, that makes your skin look red. The uh, substance P, the tachykinin, substance P and neurokinin A act on the blood vessel lining to make it leaky. They cause what's called plasma extravasation. So now the, the plasma, the, the stuff that's inside the blood vessels, has access to get outside. And so now we have this swelling. There is actually a swelling. Um, and it's hot. From the combined effect of both of these is that it's hot. You have all this blood. It's both in the blood vessels and outside of the blood vessels. So plasma extravasation um, leads to the release of substances such as bradykinin and serotonin from the blood. Um, substance P also acts on peripheral cells such as mast cells and leukocytes. And the bottom line of all of this is that you have a, a perfect storm of inflammation. And then several of these substances, virtually all of these substances, then work, operate back onto the nociceptor to either activate them, stimulate them to fire action potentials, or sensitize them, make it so that you need much, much less of a stimulus in order to get that afferent to fire. So you can see that Activating them will cause spontaneous pain. Sensitizing them is going to cause hyperalgesia and possibly um, allodynia as well. So this is, a, this is the way that peripheral um, damage leads to inflammation. And, and the reason that that, that uh, whole response leads to pain. So, the nociceptor is making this inflammation. That's why it's called neurogenic inflammation. It is making this inflammation, which then has the effect of making the pain experience, really uh, facilitating the pain experience. What can we do about that? Well, as it turns out, this is where NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, operate. They work, for example, mostly by preventing the uh, action or, or the synthesis, preventing the synthesis of prostanoids. Prostanoids include prostaglandins and prostacyclins, um, and it is, it is this is the synthesis of these compounds that is blocked by compounds such as um, ibuprofen or aspirin, uh, et cetera. So this is a really key point where medicine can intervene in the pain process. And what you're doing is not only blocking the pain, but you're blocking the nociceptors making of the pain by blocking uh, the actions of this on, on, the, on the tissue. So the less this fire, the more this is, is sensitized, the more it fires, the more it makes inflammation in the tissue. The less it fires, the less inflammation is made. So it's important to take these drugs because you're not just treating the pain, you're treating making the pain, if you, if you get my drift. In the next video, we're going to talk about silent nociceptors.